Hello everyone, it's Miss Darling in the studio. Today I thought I would respond to the few requests I got to do a video on how I decoupage clear, uh, clear glass vases. And so I'm going to do that. It'll probably be a series. I cannot cover this adequately in one video. So I will be splitting it up and hope you will come back and watch each segment as we go along so that you know what to do, what to avoid doing, and have a successful outcome. And I thought this is a good time to start this series as we get near to Christmas because don't you think making something like this would be a real treasure to give as a gift to someone you love? And that may be you, <laughs> as I found out. Um, so I'm going to show you a few examples. These are additional examples. And I want to just briefly mention that I have done a video already showing you, I think, three examples of these kinds of vases that I have made. And I will link to that video in the description box. So if you want to see those examples, please go watch that video. I may decide to pull some of that footage into this video if time permits, but I don't know that at this point, so I'm going to refer you to that video as well. Anyway, so here was one of the uh, newest faces that, well, um, let me rephrase that. This was one of the earliest vases that I did, and it's a smaller one, and I believe I bought the glass vase. I'm not sure if I bought it at Walmart or maybe Home Goods or something like that, but you can find glass vases uh, all over the place, even at thrift stores, and so it just depends on what you're looking for, the size and shape. Now, I want to say right off the bat, while I love this shape, that kind of, uh, let me kind of turn it on its side a little bit, while it blossoms out here and, and then tapers back at the bottom, adhering your decoration to a vase that is not just straight up and down is much more difficult than than the straight up kind vases. For instance, like this one. This is one that I, uh, I'm, I think I did get this at Walmart. It's a little bit smaller, but you can see that its profile is just totally straight here. And so it's the same size at the bottom as it is at the top. This is much, much easier to decoupage on a vase of this shape which is why when I show you my bigger ones, I only went for this shape because it just really gets difficult. So, and you can see I only paid 99 cents for this, wherever it was I got it. And um, it might have been a thrift store. Anyway, this one is seven and a, seven and a half inches tall by 11 and a quarter inches around but you have to pay particular attention to the inside diameter now I'm not talking about from the outside to the outside I'm talking about the inside to the inside and so this is three and a quarter inches which translates to about eight centimeters and I said this was 11 and a quarter around um, here we go, and that's about tw 28 and a half centimeters, and then we're at seven and a half inches tall, which is 19 uh, or 20. I don't know how you uh, do that. 19 to 20 centimeters tall. So that gives you, it, it's a nice, easy size to work on for your first one. And I do advise you to start simply and then learn the tradecraft 
that goes into making one of these and work your way up to the more complex shapes and sizes. So with that, um, let me show you a little bit more about this particular vase. Now this is my focal point and you have to decide in your concept early on do you want where do you want to place this if you're going to keep it for yourself or if you're going to give it to someone else where might they likely put it are they going to put it on a table where it can be seen from all sides in other, uh, uh, in other words a 360 degree view or are, is it going to be like on a mantle with a wall behind where it's only going to be seen from the front and maybe partially from one or two sides. So that's, you know, where it's going to wind up is going to affect how you design your vase. And I always design my vases primarily figuring that it could wind up being used at where it is going to be viewed from 360 degrees and so I would always have a, a major focal point and then a minor focal point on the back end and then the sides decorated leading the eye in one direction or the other so that was my philosophy you can follow along with what I've done or you know design your own philosophy for your own artistic ventures and that's perfectly okay. I chose initially vintage imagery from fine art paintings because uh, I, you know, well, first of all, because it goes with the decor of my home. But secondly, I thought if I was going to put something up for sale, I would want people to look at it as a fine art vase, not as an arts and craft vase. If you know what I mean. There is a difference and how people view it and what they think will affect their their perceived value of what they're looking at and whether they want to pay the price you are asking or not. These are time consuming. I will tell you that straight up right off the bat. You do not make these overnight uh, and so it's a process and if you're going to put them up for sale you're going to want to ask an appropriate price for a really fine creation where a lot of thought and a lot of work and effort went in to make it. This is not a cheap knockoff type and you know unfortunately when people think of vases you know they generally don't think too much in terms of buying something of huge quality. These are one of a kind. Even if you have duplicates of the imagery that you put on, there will never ever be two exactly alike. That's just an impossibility. But you really don't want that because this is, this is in my estimation, a fine art vase. It's not anything but fine art. So uh, here's my main gal and then we're going to swing on around and this was very early on in uh, long before I got into making junk journals by the way and so my stash was far more limited and um, I think the background of this one I used um, some wrapping paper actually to for the background here and uh, you work your way on around and there's butterflies and so that became the theme of this vase is my wonderful looking vintage lady artistically put on there's some a magnificent jewelry piece here and a butterfly down here was added by me and uh, so that's how this one came to be now this only has a three and a quarter inch opening here at the top. So looking down and seeing imagery inside wasn't really going to be much of an issue. So I didn't see at this point any point in putting any kind of focal points in there, but I do have decoration in there uh, all around. There is this lovely printed paper 
the colors were perfect for what is on the outside and you do want the whatever you do on the inside to have some um, coordination or some thought that went into that that goes nicely with how you've decorated the front. So the, the bottom is simply painted black. You'll notice there's a red border in here that was done with paint. It's a little bit sloppy on the on the edge there as a result. I also did this border with paint and the bottom border with paint. But then I graduated up to a, a different process that would allow me to um, do it a different way and even incorporate design. So that's vase number one idea and I hope you're thinking I hope you're thinking ahead like maybe for Christmas gifts or you know just for gifting yourself. All right here's one of my very large ones and as you can see I have this gorgeous Japanese lady in a kimono holding a parasol in uh, behind her and I really hunted a long time to find some woodblock prints of Japanese ladies in kimono that I thought were beautiful. You just don't run across an artist that that at least does my version <laughs> of what I think it is a beautiful lady. Anyway, I was lucky to find her and I'll show you a second one, a companion I made uh, by using the imagery of that same artist. Anyway, so um, here, here's the interior and I used uh, some artistic, uh, this is uh, Japanese rice paper on the inside and, um, and on the bottom as well. And even though this was a very large vase and could easily have handled other imagery on the inside, I chose not to do that. And I've got enough going on on the outside, I felt. And so here is the main focal point, and then we scroll, uh, roll, <laughs> we roll on around, and my connective imagery at this point in time was always fancy jewelry, uh, vintage or modern, it didn't matter to me. I was looking for color and shape and direction. And so we come on around, and here's a, a brooch, and um, and then uh, instead of putting another figurine back here, this same artist had these beautiful birds, and so this is also from a woodblock print of a very beautiful bird, and he's pointing in this direction to send you on around to the front and here um, I laid in a little bit of, of vertical strips here for a design purpose because my image was cut straight off here that was the edge of the paper and I didn't like the look of you know, a straight cut that went from top to bottom with nothing else there. So I graduated out of that and that was part of my artistic design concept. And you will run into issues like this as you choose different imagery for, you know, your vases, assuming you make several of them. And here I've got this beautiful dragonfly brooch and added some butterflies there and some other beautiful uh, decoration here to pull the whole thing together. The background was created using Japanese rice paper. And you can see that these have a, this one has a fancier border here 
on the top and bottom and that's actually washi tape that was used there and I'll turn it sideways so you can see the bottom there was washi tape used down here and um, so um, you know you don't have to put borders on them I think it makes it more exquisite if if you have them um, assuming they're well done and um, so that's how I made this and now I'll show you the sister to this one here's the second one and again she is from a woodblock print that the same artist made the colors are a little bit different but the theme is the same so we have a Japanese lady in a beautiful kimono very thoughtful look in her eyes and we come on around here I have just a single brooch and here we have the beginning of the back image which again is another bird and this was also a creation of the same artist I added the butterflies and various other things to it to you know pull the eye in the direction I wanted and so here we've got this image coming up here pulling the eye to the butterfly and the butterfly pulling the eye on around to the main focal point again let's take a look at the interior this is also done with Japanese rice paper a different color a little bit different uh, type of um, more you know vertical stripes in this particular paper again I used washi tape at the top and the bottom as my borders and um, there is also another piece of Japanese rice paper here in the background tying everything together color wise and just feeling wise and I thought uh, she came out very beautifully now I should mention that you know especially when you get into these larger sizes you don't want to pick them up by the rim uh, which tends to be most people's habit you know pick something up and carry it around by the rim you can break it these are breakable and so oh there's a note I had in there when it was um, take that out so uh, let's take a look at the bottom of that there is a another image in the bottom no image along the sides but but another type of image there uh, or I guess it was a different paper anyway it's a different color and uh, I thought that was just really beautiful and um, so you want to at going back to what I was saying don't carry it like this and certainly not by just one hand you want to want to carry it down here and these vases are of course all glass and so you can put a live bouquet of flowers or uh, branches or whatever you want to put in the vase for for decorating you can put that in there you can fill this up with water what you cannot do is submerge the whole thing in water because everything that's on the outside is um, will be de literally destroyed if you submerge it in water uh, you can wipe it down with a damp cloth of course but you don't want to get it fully wet on the outside so bear that in mind as you decide where you might want to have one of these or for what purpose you would use it for or and certainly if you give it away as a gift or you sell it you need to make sure your customer understands not to su ever submerge it in water or any liquid for that matter 
And so this is the last example I'm going to show you in this video. This again is the same size as the other two. Um, the imagery, um, the face is larger, so you might think that the vase is larger, but it's not. It's exactly the same size as, as the last two that I showed you. But anyway, this was a fine art image, and um, so I chose her as my focal point, and this is my artistic statement uh, that I've used in the past. She's very lovely and has this beautiful necklace on. Now let's pull around and we see jewelry here. That's to kind of cover uh, something up, but it's also for design purposes. You can see the I chose a really bold rice paper for the background of this one. And it doesn't show a whole lot because of everything I put on it, but I just really like that paper for color and design purposes. And you can see I've added some jewelry imagery there. And then on the back, we have this beautiful lady here. And the name of the artist is Paul Berthon is the artist. And um, I just really love this. I thought color-wise, design-wise, it fit beautifully. And that's the back. But, of course, it could be the front. Uh, it just depends on what, what you want to feature at any point in time. And then moving on around, again, we see the jewelry and how I was choosing to connect the back to the front. And so we come on around again to our front. And so let's take a look at the inside of this. This one, I chose some, this was actually wrapping paper. And it's very vintage British um, looking and got, you know, some... Uh, British looking insignias all over it and so I thought that would make a really beautiful interior and the colors go just so well with the exterior and then at the bottom uh, there are some cherubs and I believe that was from a napkin I have a napkin with these cherubs all over it and so I put that there on the bottom and uh, there is no border on the inside, but on the outside, now we have a different washi tape that, that I used up here. And uh, there is no border on the bottom of this one. And that's, I guess, probably because I didn't want to, for some reason, cover I guess maybe I got too close to the bottom with this image and I didn't want a border running across there that that made this area here uh, smaller than it is. And that was for uh, design purposes. And so um, you do need to plan ahead, but uh, you must recognize that the larger your vase is, the more complicated it gets, and the, the larger your imagery has to be, because it needs to be in proper scale to the size of the vase, and that becomes a, a lot more difficult to find what you need to go in certain places. And that's the advantage you have of of working on something smaller. There's just a lot more imagery that's going to be available to you. I don't want to discourage you from too much from doing large ones, but I you definitely need to know that you have to grow into them and don't try to tackle a really large one right off the bat. And um, so I, in my future videos on this subject, I will go into my techniques of how I 
conceive my concept, how I go about pulling together my imagery, what's my thought process from a design standpoint, and, um, and then tricks of the trade of what you need to know to lay it down appropriately and so that it looks just the way you want it to look uh, and, and eliminates problems that can always set in along the way. So that said, that we'll have to do for the show and tell and we'll get in now to some of the early things that you need to know if you're going to do one at all. Now remember I said that the diameter, the inside diameter here at the top, you have to pay very much close attention to that because when you work on these you're going to be working on them upside down and so they have to have a stand to sit on that is small enough to go through the vase and taller than the vase because we want you know I would say a good um, four five six inches at the bottom and that will become more apparent to you as you start making your own and so the first thing I suggest you do is look around your your home your apartment your garage wherever to see if you already have something that is narrower than well first you have to go get your vase and I've already talked about size and shape so I'll leave that to you to go find the right vase that you want to work on once you have your vase then look for something that will fit in like this and that is taller than the vase now I didn't have anything in my home that was going to do that so I had to make my own stands so let me show you what I did I went to Home Depot and I found these flat round wooden I'm gonna call it a disc uh, I don't know uh, what else to call it anyway there it's um, it's about uh, I think a diameter of 12 inches and um, about half an inch thick and so I needed something that was going to be big enough to kind of catch some of the splatter that was going to happen as I varnished it but also had uh, something that was tall and thin enough now for this size this is perfect because it easily goes in there and um, let me try to show it this way it uh, the vase easily goes over the stand and the size of the dowel and that's what this is uh, the dowel is um, big enough to pretty much hold this vase steady and now that's going to become a problem as you get into wider vases and I'll explain that in a, in a moment but for right now this is a good size and I have plenty of space at the bottom you know to, to work comfortably and so let me give you the the diameter of this dowel that I used this is a two inch this is a two inch diameter or roughly um, five centimeters okay so now I also put these arrows pointing downward and that was to remind me that my vase is going to be worked on upside down and so when I apply my imagery to it I have to remember that this is up and this is down right and I I screwed up on one of them 
which I don't know where it is now. It's, I guess, in storage. But I did have one that I forgot that this is actually my top. And so when it's, when it's on the stand, like, like so, I, without thinking, I just uh, put my imagery here, you know, with the top up here. So then <laughs> when, I, when I got it all glued on and, and um, took it off the stand to look at it, I realized that my imagery was all upside down. And so that could only be used as a stand and not a vase anymore. <laughs> so I use it as a vase. All my imagery uh, looks funny. So that was really disappointing. So in order to help prevent that from happening to me again, I put these down arrows right here on the stand as a reminder. Um, and that seemed to help a lot because I never made that mistake again. Now I'm going to show you what you've got to do if you have a much wider diameter. If you're working on a larger vase, and it doesn't even have to get to be too much larger, a two inch, or yeah, a two inch dowel is not going to be big enough to keep your vase steady once it's on. You're, you know, you're gonna find it, it'll slip to one side or the other, and that's a big nuisance. And so, very quickly, I learned that I needed to put something on top of the dowel that would give me a bigger surface. It still has to be small enough to go through the diameter of the vase, but once the vase is hanging on it, I want it to be as steady as I can as I work on it. And so having a little wider top, and so I thought, well, what can I use to glue onto the top of the dowel and that will give me a, a bigger surface there? I found these square um, beveled blocks that were quite cheap. It's small enough to easily go through the larger vases from, from a medium size to one of the really large ones and yet you know, small enough that it, the vase would still fit on it. And, of course, I also needed that extra height because the wider the dimension, uh, the, the wider the diameter of your vase, the taller it's likely going to be. And so this is, um, what do we cut these to? My husband helped me make these. Um... 15 and a half inches. So I bought one long two inch dowel and then had it cut into approximately, what did I just get through saying? I had it cut into probably thirds or something like that so I could get as many stands made as from, you know, a single piece as I could because I was making them every day for a while and so the once you get the design put on then you go into the last phase is a lacquering phase and that takes around 30 days to complete that process uh, because you're putting a coat on every day and then letting it dry and so I didn't want to wait 30 days to free up a stand because you want to leave them on the stand upside down while you're coating them and letting them dry and so uh, I needed several of these so that I could gang produce them if you will anyway um, <laughs> mass produce them uh, in a very small quantity of mass, but certainly more than one or two at a time. So I wound up when I was doing these full time, I would probably have five, six vases 
in various stages on the go at any one particular time. And so I needed uh, quite a few stands. But you only need uh, that if, if you're going to be making, decide you love it so much, you want to make a bunch of these. And, um, and you want to do them as quickly as possible. You've got your vase, you've got the stands, and now uh, I need to just quickly go into some of the other tools that you're going to need. Obviously a pair of scissors, perhaps a cutting blade. You're going to need to have the papers that you're going to use. I will talk more about that in the next video. As much as possible you want to have this clearly thought out from beginning to end so you've got everything you need from start to finish and that really becomes important if um, because you have to apply your imagery in a certain sequence. It's one sequence for the interior design and it's a different sequence for the outer design and I'll go into that more later but you want to have everything you need to apply your imagery you're going to need something like Mod Podge now I did not uh, honestly use much Mod Podge in the making of mine I went to an acrylic product that um, was really high gloss and I'll show you what that was at the time I get to that point but you certainly could you know especially on your first piece if you have Mod Podge already uh, you can do that I do not advise using matte unless you particularly want a matte looking vase but if you want it to still uh, kind of look more like a glass vase when you get all done then you're going to want to use a high gloss luster so that you can get as much sheen and shine off your imagery as you would if you were looking straight at at the glass it, it's up to you whether you want a gloss surface or a matte surface uh, this certainly is workable as well. I chose gloss for these particular vases and was happy that I did and I applied them with just a simple rubber applicator. Uh, I bought a whole bunch of these in this size from uh, Walmart for practically nothing, you know like five bucks or something and I got maybe 15, 20 or so and I recommend you use a smaller one. Uh, you can, of course, use bigger ones, but they need to be small enough to easily dip into your jar. And um, as you can see, this is a good size for uh, this particular Mod Podge container. If you have a much wider lip or diameter on your material uh, of course you can use a wider one and that will cut down on the time and effort that you expend obviously uh, you, it's like painting a wall the smaller the tool you use the longer it's going to take you but you, you need to make sure that it's going to be easy to dip it in and out unless you pour uh, your product out into another container and that's always an option as well. I didn't like to do that. I like to keep it all there where I can quickly put a lid back on to preserve it as long as possible. So that's kind of it. You need paper, you need scissors, you probably need a, a blade and a metal straight edge because uh, you're going to be doing a lot of cutting initially and um, and then you'll need um, adhesive that you not only put on to initially adhere it to the vase, but that you continue to put on 
afterwards to build up a surface that is very shiny and protective of your imagery. So that said, I think that's probably all I'm going to cover in this particular video. And so I encourage you, if you want to craft along with me uh, between now and when my next video, part two, surfaces, you have time to go out and buy a vase, get the tools, uh, maybe make a stand if you don't have something that your vase will fit over comfortably and um, you know get everything you need ready to go at your fingertips and then join me in part two and I will discuss concepts for design and my thinking what why I choose what I choose uh, and how I make sure everything coordinates well together and some of my my thinking along design elements that I think about as I put my concept together. There's nothing worse than putting all that time, energy, and cost into your product and then winding up with something that is discouraging at the end and that makes you unhappy. So I'll try to give you as much guidance as I can and thanks for being with me. With that said, this is Miss Darling calling this a wrap. Bye-bye.